I'm thankful to the Lord for another opportunity to gather ourselves as a local church around this wonderful book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible. So if you would, go ahead and go there with me to chapter 12. Today we'll be in verses 21 to 32. Exodus 12, 21 to 32. Today we come to the Passover and the tenth plague rolled together into one. Now, as I've said many times, often it's challenging to discern how much to take on and how to split things apart. But it seems to me that these two things really need to go together uh, because they are one and the same. God passes over his people as he strikes the Egyptians. So it makes sense to take both of these together. So the title for the sermon this morning is The Faithful Passover and the Final Plague. The the Passover is a demonstration of God's faithfulness. And it is a demonstration that God does what he says he's going to do. Uh, We can always trust the Lord. When God speaks, we know that it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in the way God said it. And that's the reason we can live rock-solid Christian lives is because uh, we're not hoping in in a maybe. We're not hoping in a possibility, we're hoping in a certainty that has already been accomplished and that is sealed by the truth, the truthfulness of our God. So the final or the faithful Passover and the final plague. Throughout this first part of Exodus, God has shown his glory. We've seen many things about God and I hope that your doctrine of God has expanded as you've been going through these 10 plagues. You may be thinking, oh, what, what relevance do the 10 plagues have for me? Well, if, if it is relevant to know who God is, then they are eminently relevant because we learn so much about the character of God, about his attributes, about what he does in history and how he relates to sinners, how he relates to his people. Learn so much about this through the ten plagues. We've seen God's power, his sovereignty over space and time, over human hearts, over all that exists, past, present, and future. We've seen his supremacy over all other so-called gods, and we've seen his judgment and his salvation. God has hardened Pharaoh's heart. He has brought judgment on Egypt, and he has shown his people that he alone has the power to save and preserve them. Undoubtedly, the people of God during this time were quite discouraged. I mean, we ran into that earlier, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but they were quite discouraged. Maybe they had just become kind of practical atheists in some ways, some of them beginning to sort of live as though really that this, this is just the way life is, and there's no help for them. There's no hope for them. Life is meaningless And it has no purpose. Maybe some of the Israelites are tempted to sort of begin to blend in with Egyptian religion, the syncretism to start worshiping Egyptian gods or at least look among the Egyptian gods for the help that they, as they see it, have not received from the God of their forefathers. Throughout the ten plagues, the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is declaring the truth that he alone can save and preserve his people, that he alone is their God, that he alone should be trusted with their lives. And now the climax of the plagues has come. Now we have reached the point that God was talking about when he said to Moses in chapter 7, verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand against Egypt And bring out the people of Israel from among them. So the Exodus is right around the corner as we come to our passage for today. The Exodus is the next thing on the list. The tenth plague has come. God is about to bring his people out of slavery, out of bondage, out of oppression. He is about to bring his people to himself. And our time in the 10 plagues has helped us to see God's priority. I want you to really focus on this. This is so important for trying to understand what is the relevance of the 10 plagues and what are, what are the takeaways that we're supposed to have and what is probably the biggest takeaway that we're to have 
from this section of the Bible, this section of Exodus, known as the Ten Plagues? Well, I think the biggest thing is that it helps us to see God's priority. We find it stated most clearly in chapter 9, verse 16, in his message to Pharaoh. This is what the Lord says to Pharaoh through Moses. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power, and here it is, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. That's what God is doing. That's what God is about in the 10 plagues. That's God's number one priority. He is ensuring that his name, who he is, his character, his renown, his reputation will be proclaimed in all the earth. And we saw this very same thing at the beginning of Romans. Remember Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Paul says that we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. What? For the sake of his name among all the nations. For the sake of God's name. Why did God send Christ? Why did God declare Christ through the apostles? Why did God send the ten plagues? Why did the Israelites end up in Egypt? Why did God bring them out of Egypt for the sake of his name? For the sake of his renown in all the earth, among all the nations. That the name of God may be proclaimed in all the earth. That is God's priority. So let me ask all of us this question. Is it our priority? A lot of things, the Christian life gets muddled. It gets polluted with all sorts of worldly ideas. It gets watered down and inch deep with prevailing evangelical culture? What is God's priority? What is God about in all that he does? Why did God save us? Why are we here this morning worshiping him? Why are we here? Why is there anything at all for the sake of his name? This must be the priority of every Christian. It must be the priority of every faithful Christian church. This is the thing we should ask ourselves at the very beginning of the day and at the end of the day. Is my life about God's name being proclaimed in all the earth? Wherever I can bring God's renown, that's my job. That's why I breathe. That's why I had breakfast to eat this morning. That's why I have life and being. It's for the sake of God's holy name. So if you would go ahead and stand with me now as we read God's word together. Exodus 12, verses 21 to 32. This is the holy word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit and profitable for making us complete, fully equipped for every good work, able to make us wise, Unto salvation through Christ Jesus. Beginning in verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that Yahweh will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of Yahweh's Passover 
For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Verse 29, at midnight, or in the middle of the night, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who is in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people both you and the people of Israel, and go serve Yahweh as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. You can go ahead and be seated. We'll stop here. We could have included verse 33. We could have gone up through verse 36, but we seem to have the exodus beginning there. In verse 33, the people begin to move around. You start to get uh, that beginning. So we're going to stop here as the other plague accounts have stopped with the interaction with Pharaoh. So too here we'll stop with verse 32. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his grace as we gather around his word that this would not be in vain, that we would not be thinking about uh, whatever we're having for lunch or what we're doing this afternoon or what we have to do tomorrow or what we were doing on Friday or whatever uh, or our ailments, (laughs) whatever it is, that we would be right here in this moment that God has ordained in his goodness and that we would learn from his word so that we might worship him and proclaim his name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us this time together. We ask that it would be sanctified, that it would be set apart, Lord, that it would be consecrated unto you in our hearts. Uh, Lord, that each of us would be vigilant now as your word is being taught, vigilant to listen with our ears and with our hearts, And Lord, vigilant to ask ourselves in the moment, how might I live this? How might I be a doer of this word? God, we pray that your spirit would guide the teaching and the hearing. And Lord, that you would be magnified and glorified through this time. Lord, we pray for anyone among us this morning who's not a Christian, uh, maybe just interested in Christianity, maybe hostile, uh, maybe just here because Mama or Grandma said, I'd like you to come. Father, we pray for whoever is here this morning who is not a believer. We pray that they would see you in your glory, that the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of your judgment upon sinners would be clear to them and that they would see it and know it and believe it. Lord, and that they would see the glory of Christ and his blood and that they would run to Jesus, that they would kiss the Son, that they would flee to this Savior. Father, we pray that you would do this work among us today, and we pray that our time together horizontally would be mutually edifying. God, we pray that uh, we would not just be little islands of devotion to Jesus, Lord, but that we would be uh, loving Jesus by loving his body. And we pray that that would be manifested today as we gather. And in the conversations we have, our attentiveness to the interests and needs of others, and our desire to build one another up. Father, we pray that all that happens here today would glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we pull together these two big events that are uh, really one and the same, the Passover and the 10th plague, we see three things as we walk through this text, as I describe them sometimes, three rungs on a ladder, three stepping stones, really to help us understand what is going on in this text, to understand its structure, to understand the various parts of it that we need to understand in order to get the whole. So the faithful Passover and the final plague, we see the instructions from Moses in verses 21 to 27, the beginning of 27, the response of Israel Uh, verses 27 to 28, and then the attack on Egypt from 29 to 32. So the instructions from Moses, the response of Israel, and the attack on Egypt. So let's begin with the instructions from Moses. Back at the beginning of chapter 12, we got the Passover introduced. And so the Passover is so important. It's so huge 
in the life of ancient Israel and so huge in its theological import and in uh, its pointing to Christ that it really has to be dwelled upon. And that's, I think, part of the reason that the Holy Spirit has given us so many references to it as we march through this text. And we'll get more as we get more detail about the Passover, even as we, uh, after the Exodus, as the Exodus is underway. But at the beginning of chapter 12, the Passover was introduced to us. God's instructions to Moses and Aaron. That's where God himself, Yahweh himself, introduces the Passover by telling Moses and Aaron what they are to do, how they are to lead the people. Now, Moses delivers those instructions to the people through the elders. Now, we know that Israel is divided up by tribes. There are the 12 tribes of Israel, the the 12 sons of Jacob constitute the head or the patriarch of 12 separate tribes. And within each of those tribes, there are clans and families and so forth. So there's a structure within Israelite society. And Moses delivers the instructions to the elders of the people. Uh, These instructions will then disseminate, as we'll see later, we'll see the people referred to. These instructions will disseminate throughout the people through the elders. And we are not given an exhaustive account of what Moses said. It is more of an abbreviated version that focuses on two aspects, the blood and the memorial. We've gotten instructions that the Lord has given Moses. Not all of those are repeated here, but undoubtedly, as we've seen before in Exodus, everything that God told Moses to tell the people, you better believe he told the people, all of it. But here we get an abbreviated version. We could summarize Moses' instructions with four sentences. And this is what we're gonna, how we're going to march through this first point. Four sentences summarize these instructions from Moses. And here they are. Apply the blood. Stay in your houses. Continue the Passover. And explain it to your kids. Apply the blood. Stay in your houses. Continue the Passover. And explain it to your kids. So first, apply the the blood. Look at verses 21 to 22, the first part of 22. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel <clears throat> and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. The blood of the Passover lamb is at the center. And as we saw when the Passover was introduced, on the 10th day, the Israelites are to all go and select a lamb, a lamb for each household. And if households need to team up on a lamb, then they can do that if households are too small. And so they're to go and select a lamb on the 10th day, and they're to care for that lamb and wait four days on the 14th day at twilight. They are to kill those lambs. We don't get all of those instructions repeated here, but that's what we know Moses told the people. And at the center of this entire thing is the blood. The blood of the Passover lamb. And as God had instructed him, the blood is to be applied to the doorposts and lintel of all the houses. The blood is, of course, not important if you're slaughtering an animal. We think, you know, if you, you kill a deer or, or something else, you know, or a, a, a bull or a cow, you You don't have any use for the blood. The blood is unimportant. Here, the blood is precious. And the blood is to be gathered up and put into a basin deep enough within the basin so that you could dip hyssop into it. Type of plant, a bushy kind of hairy type of plant at the end where you would use that as a paintbrush for the blood and you would put the blood on the doorposts of the house as well as the lintel. It is applied, as I said, with hyssop, which is often used for purification and cleansing in the Old Testament. So this is is just setting the tone for this use of hyssop throughout. So why must the blood be applied? What is the significance of the blood? And for that, we need to go to the second part of the instructions, which is stay in your houses. Very sober warning. Do not leave. Don't go out. Don't come out of your house in the middle of the night. Stay inside. Look at verses 22b to 23. 
None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Why? For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Here, Moses gives the reason for the blood by explaining what's going to happen in the middle of the night. He says, Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood, when God sees the blood on the front of the houses of the Israelites, he will pass over them. In other words, what will happen to the Egyptians when there is no blood to cover them? will not happen to the Israelites, not on account of the fact that they are merely Israelites, notice that, but on account of the fact that there is the blood. The blood that is painted on the top of the door and on the sides of the door purifies and consecrates them. The people must stay in their houses. In other words, they must hide behind the blood. The people must hide behind the blood. The blood itself is their refuge and safety. Out from under the blood of the sacrifice, there is nothing but destruction because God will see their sin. Let me say that again. Out from under the blood, there is nothing but destruction because God will see their sin. The holy God will not pass through Egypt, cannot pass through Egypt without seeing the sin of his people in addition to the sin of the Egyptians. All the sin of his people's hearts, just as we found after Noah and before Noah, the inclination of the hearts, evil from youth. Well, that includes God's people. That includes Moses and Aaron. It includes all of them. Even the most devout sinners, Every single Egyptian, a sinner. Every single Israelite, a sinner. Every person in this room and in history, a sinner. And unless God sees the blood, there is no refuge from sin. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, one of those wonderfully quotable verses in Scripture says, in him, or in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We know that the Passover lamb, as it is picked up in the New Testament, is pointing to Christ. This lamb points to the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the lamb of God who was slain, the righteous who died in the place of the unrighteous, the blameless one, the one without defect, the sinless God-man, dies in the place of sinners. And unless the blood of Christ, this is the gospel, this is the gospel, unless the blood of Christ, our substitutionary atonement, covers our sin, we will die in our sins and face God's judgment. Listen, this is the only safe place. This is the only place of refuge for the sinner. Do you have the blood covering you this morning? Really? Really? The blood of Christ. Are you really a Christian in that sense? I didn't ask you how you grew up. I didn't ask you how you feel about God. I didn't ask you how many times you come to church or even read your Bible. I ask you, does the blood of Christ cover you or not? Because apart from that, There is no safety. As it says in verse 23, he will pass over the door and he will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. This is an intense intense picture. 
God is passing through and he is bringing death. He's bringing destruction. But when he sees that blood, all that death, all that destruction, all that judgment and wrath and anger and fury against sin, which is God's holiness and justice at work in this sinful world. All of that will pass right on. Praise God. Praise God for his grace. How could we endure on that day? We would not. We would be swept away. So what are we to make of this destroyer This destroyer that's mentioned, quite interesting. He says, as I just read, the destroyer, he will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. What are we to make of this figure? Let me give you a few quotes to give you three different approaches. So I thought about how to bring this up because this came up in our gospel community group and several people have asked me about this destroyer. So I kind of wrestled with the extent to which I wanted to get into this. Some of you may not have given two thoughts to this. Some of you may have given a hundred thoughts to this. Uh, I don't know. But what I want to do is give you three quotes from three different commentators who have different approaches <laughs> to this particular destroyer. And so you can see their reasoning and how they're thinking about this and what evidence they're bringing in. And you can see just the different viewpoints. It's not a clear-cut answer. So one, Walter Kaiser says this. I'll try to read through these quickly, but just listen for the differences. Walter Kaiser, and these are all major commentators on Exodus, Walter Kaiser says, the destroyer is not a demonic power that rivals God, but is probably an angel of the Lord who expedites the divine will. So speaking there of a created angel like Michael or Gabriel. In Psalm 78, 49, however, which uses four different words for anger to express God's letting loose on the Egyptians, this wrath is collectively called a band of destroying angels. Thus, Whether an angel is the mediating agent or the term is a figurative personification of the final judgment of God on Egypt, it is still God's direct work. So all of that just to say he's leaving open the possibility that angel or the destroyer is meant to be kind of a personification of God's wrath, if that makes sense. Or, as he thinks, more likely it's an angelic being, that God's literally the images God is, God is going through, whatever that means. And an angel, a created spirit being, is going into these houses executing God's judgment. And we see angels throughout the Bible doing things of that sort. A different commentator, a different approach, T. Desmond Alexander writes this, Some commentators view the destroyer as an angel. Support for this interpretation may be found in Psalm 78, 49, which forms part of a passage describing the Exodus. Yet, while some translations take Psalm 78, 49 as referring to a company of destroying angels, this could equally be interpreted as a band of deadly messengers, referring to God's fury, indignation, and calamity, which are mentioned in the same verse. The evidence... For associating Psalm 78, 49 with the supposed destroyer of Exodus 12, 23 is weak. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, reference is made to the destroyer of the firstborn. And he cites Hebrews eleven twenty eight, and 1 Corinthians 10, 10. But no further identification of the destroyer is offered. Since the evidence for the destroyer apart from Yahweh is weak, it seems preferable to understand this word as meaning destruction. And so what he argues here is there's really no figure at all. It's just, in the Hebrew, it's just meant to be understood as destruction. God will not send his destruction into the house to to strike, to bring death. So there's another viewpoint. Let me give you a, a third one. This is by Douglas Stewart. He writes, the destroyer could be none other than the angel of the Lord. Revealed as the angel that causes death in such contexts as 2 Samuel 24, 16 and Isaiah 37, 36. This angel directly represents God and is thus the angel Yahweh. Yahweh manifesting himself in angelic form. And so this particular view is that it is the angel of the Lord himself, which we were introduced to back in Genesis and of course at the burning bush. And the angel of the Lord is the Lord. 
And some argue whether the angel of the Lord should be understood as the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, There seems to be distinction there between Yahweh himself and the angel of Yahweh, uh, but there also is kind of an equation between the two, and so uh, an equivalent between the two, and so it's understood that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. So as you can see, there's a, a lot of different views on this, and even little sub-views. You know, if it's the angel of the Lord, does that mean Yahweh himself, uh, Yahweh the pre-incarnate Christ? Uh, As I said, uh, there are different viewpoints on this. What's the sum? Uh, What's the sum of all this? For those of you who have recently fallen asleep in the sermon, uh, the sum of all of this is that Yahweh did it. Yahweh did it, period. Verse 23, for Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians. Verse 29, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. You know, we're not really given what I would call the metaphysical mechanics of how God did this. We're not told precisely what mechanism God used or what means he used. Uh, really, that's beyond our understanding here. Could have been a created being. An angel could have, could have been just a way of referring to his destruction. Could have been the angel of the Lord, as we've seen, appearing throughout Genesis and Exodus. But the point is that the Lord is the one who saves. And the Lord is the one who judges. And angels don't save us from anything. Angels do the work of Yahweh. The Lord is the one who brought judgment upon the Egyptians. And the Lord is the one himself who passed over the houses of the Israelites. Third, we get the instruction to continue the Passover. Look at verses 24 to 25. So if you've lost track where we are, we're looking at the various instructions that Moses gave. And so we've looked at the first two, apply the blood, stay in your houses. Why? Because the, destroy, because the Lord is coming through and the destroyer will not go in. And then thirdly, we come to continue the Passover. Look at verses 24 to 25. You shall observe this rite as a statute For you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that Yahweh will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. Last week we saw the importance of commemoration, that God's works would be known to future generations. This is important. The Lord prioritizes this, that there be memorial for his works, that future generations come to know what God has done. So Moses conveys God's instructions that the Passover celebration is to be observed among the Israelites. It is to be a perpetual observance. It is to be done in perpetuity to future generations. When God's people receive the land of Canaan, (coughs) as God promised Abraham, they must continue this observance. They must continue to remember the saving work of their God, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what is one of the biggest reasons why they must remember so that they will not go after other gods. We know that's what happens, right? When they get to Canaan, lose sight of the Lord, lose sight of what he's done, lose sight of his saving work, and we begin to go after other gods. And that's exactly what we do. We lose sight of God's saving work in Christ. We lose sight of the Passover fulfilled. And when we do that, we begin to go after other gods. Look at your life. We know this is true. We lose sight of the gospel. We stop reading our Bibles. We're not focused on giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord in all of life. And what happens? Cling, 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 cling to all sorts of things. People, things, pleasures, comforts, ambitions, That's what we live for because we lose sight of the saving work of God in Christ. And that is the reason that it is so important that this be memorialized and commemorated constantly. This is one of the big reasons we come to church every week with God's people. This is one of the reasons we frequently practice the Lord's Supper. This is the reason that private worship and family worship are so important. This is the reason Daniel prayed three times a day because our hearts err so 
easily and so quickly. We pray before breakfast. We're trudging around in sin. By mid-morning, we constantly need to be brought back. Continue the Passover, and then finally, explain it to your kids. Verses 26 to the first part of 27. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. With observances come questions, right? Right? Questions from little mouths, questions from little onlookers, little eyes see what we do. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, great grandmas, great grandpas, little people see what we do. They see what we love, they see what we value. And when they see, they ask questions. And parents are tasked with teaching their children about the powerful saving work of God. Parents are to tell their kids what is happening, the meaning of it, and specifically how it displays God's grace. Let me challenge you here. You may be thinking, because you do it regularly, that you're leading your kids in this way. But if you're giving them some little verse, and then you're just talking about life, how much are you rooting them in the saving work of God? Read the scriptures, large chunks of scripture. Read the Bible. Our kids can handle it. Read biographies. Read the history of the church. We act as though kids can't sit still for two minutes and read the Bible. you got to give them some little quippy verse and then a couple big ideas and that's it. And we've done it. Yes, Pat, right here. No. No. We need our children to understand the mighty works of God throughout history. We need our children to see the big scope of Scripture and all the little details in between. And it takes years, but it takes commitment. That's the work of the people of God. That's what we must do. This call goes out to all parents and grandparents among God's people. Genesis 18, 19, this is what the Lord said to Abraham, for I have chosen him, that he may command, or concerning Abraham, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. To command his children and his household after him to bring God's truth to our children. Explain it to your kids. Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. 19, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And in the New Testament, we get language like this. In Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord uh, with a mind to their weakness, with a mind to their simplicity, with a mind to their frailty, with much long suffering and much patience gentleness and kindness and self-control with God's help. We are to not provoke them to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do you see this as part of what it means to be a Christian? This is not a side thing. This is not a subcategory. This is not something, well, you know, the, this is super Christians do this sort of thing. No, no. This is at the heart of what it means to be God's people. This is at the heart of what it means to be a worshiper of Yahweh. That brings us to our second stepping stone, and that is the response of Israel. We've seen the instructions from Moses, this four-part instruction. Now we come to the response of Israel. Look at the end of verse 27 through 28. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. These are lovely verses. Lovely verses. The prayer is that these verses would be written on our lives. Throughout the ten plagues, we haven't seen much at all about the Israelites. They kind of have been sort of a silent group. We know that God has shielded them. But we don't know what they're thinking 
We just, we don't, we don't get a lot of info on what's going on in the hearts of the Israelites, individual Israelites, or what's going on collectively among the people. What are they saying to one another? How are they responding to what's going on around them as Egypt is being blasted? Just blasted over and over and over again. The last we heard, they were not accepting Moses' message. The last thing we heard was that it wasn't looking good. They were not walking in line behind Moses. So we read chapter 6, verse 9, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery, and they were beat down with life. You know what? The Lord was gracious to them. That's our heavenly Father. When we're beat down in life, the Lord lifts us up. The Lord is patient and kind to us. He is long-suffering with us. And we see that even though they did not listen, God reached down and continued to work with them. God could have said, fine, fine, and pushed them aside. But that's not what the Lord did. They did not listen to Moses, and God continued to press forward with them. Well, it appears that now they are ready to listen. Ten plagues or nine plagues later. God has shown them his glory. He has magnified his faithfulness, rescuing love and supremacy over the gods of Egypt. He has shown them that he's not just the God of story time. He's not just the God of uh, the old days. Not just some sort of set of myths to rehearse as a family in order that our traditions may be maintained and our, our identity, our ethnic and national identity well, might continue. No, this God is real and he has shown his reality. He has shown his people who he is and he has shown them that he has not abandoned them. God does that in our lives in many, many ways. In many ways, he shows us that he has not abandoned us. The problem is we're not paying attention. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you'd be kind of like, God's just, he's just not helping me at all. I'm just on my own. Things are just rough and you're in a grumbly kind of way. And, you know, just, just kind of beat down with life, whatever it is, whatever circumstances. Uh, the, the problem is not that God's not doing things. The problem is we're not paying attention. We're like that cow I talked about last week. We, are, we have our face in the dirt. Our face is in the grass. And we're just eating up the grass and we're not looking around. We're not meditating and reflecting and, and thinking and praying and, and conversating with God's people. We're not paying attention to all the ways that he's told us, I am. I am who I am. I am with you. I am present. I have not abandoned you. So what is their response? What is the response of Israel? Well, it echoes their initial response to Moses back in chapter 4, verse 31, when they came forward and God had given Moses those signs to do in front of them. We read this, and the people believed. And when they had heard that Yahweh had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. It's a beautiful picture. But now this trust and worship is explicitly said to result in obedience. It is accompanied by obedience. They do what God tells them to do. This is what it says. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Let me say this to all of us, and I've beat this drum a lot because it appears a lot in Exodus, but what we need to understand is that there is no identity as the people of God apart from a life of obedience to God. Uh, Christians who, professing Christians who claim identity in Christ, claim to belong to God because of some prayer prayed or some sort of little period of time or some occasional glimmer of of happiness about God after an espresso or something like that. That, that. that sort of thing, apart from obedience of life, in the hard, in the grit, in the sacrifices of life, in the re God says it, I do it. God says, don't do this. 
and I don't do it. God says, do this, and I do it. That's the life of a Christian. That's the life of someone in covenant with God to claim this identity, this standing in grace with no obedience of life is a lie. It is a lie. And John says it in 1 John. If you claim to have God who is light and walk in darkness, you are a liar and do not practice the truth. There is no identity as the people of God apart from obedience of life. Finally, we come to the attack on Egypt, verses 29 to 32. Let's go there. At midnight, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve Yahweh, as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also." Wow. Here we have the final strike, the final plague, although the Red Sea climax is yet to come. That's really the, you know, the, the ultimate capstone on top of the capstone. God strikes the firstborn from the height of society to the lowest of the low, and even the livestock do not escape. Some have asked whether this involves all the firstborn or just the firstborn males. And by the way, it is such a blessing to get these sorts of questions after a sermon and to talk with people and to see the kinds of questions. I mean, just, just, uh, I just want to say it's such a blessing to hear the kinds of questions that are going around in gospel community groups and Bible study. But what a blessing, uh, I will say, for me and my family to be part of a church where there's that kind of concern about what exactly the Lord is saying in his word and, and this, this concern to know precisely in the little details, not just the big ideas, the takeaways, you know, the little nuggets, but, but in all the little details what it is that God has said to us. It is really an encouraging blessing. But some have asked about this whole firstborn thing. Is it the firstborn in general or just firstborn males? Since the word itself that is used is not definitive, and I would say that, oh, this is argued among commentators, but I would say that the biblical evidence suggests that it is just the firstborn males, and that's the prevailing view. Two passages are particularly helpful here, so you don't have to flip there, I'll read them to you. But chapter 4, verses 22 to 23, um, this is when the whole idea of God taking the firstborn is first mentioned. And it says this, then you shall say to Pharaoh, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So their firstborn is identified specifically with regard to uh, this firstborn sons. We also see in chapter 13, verses 12 to 13, after our passage, and we'll get there, uh, when the firstborn are to be dedicated to the Lord, this is what it says. You shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. And that, of course, sounds like, okay, this is all the firstborn across the board, daughters and sons. But then it goes on to say this. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And so there, in line with chapter four, we see that the firstborn are the, it refers to the firstborn son. So I think that evidence is, is pretty conclusive. The strike on Egypt, as we read here, is cataclysmic. Every household is affected. The response, as we read, is a great cry. You know, it really doesn't take long for us to, to think about this with some, some sympathy, and empathy for uh, even these Egyptian people to think about 
uh, what it is. And, and we, we, we do sympathize with sinners in the misery they experience and the destruction that they will endure. We don't want sinners to perish. We don't want our unbelieving friends and family. We don't want the people that we work with to die and go to hell. We don't want them to experience God's judgment. You can't help but read this and just begin to think, just sim uh, sim similar to what we find with Herod and the babies, killing the babies around Bethlehem, as we read in the Gospel of Matthew. You can't help but to read this, especially if you're a parent, and just, just feel your heart sinking. The response is a great cry. The response is weeping and wailing. And as I thought about this response, it reminds us, as we think about this response to God's judgment, it reminds us of Jesus' words about hell. When, when Jesus talks about hell, by the way, Jesus has a whole lot to say about hell. He was quite the hellfire and brimstone preacher, Jesus was. He had a lot to say about God's wrath and God's hell, which often gets overlooked. But in Luke chapter 13, verse 28, he referred to hell as a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's this picture of, of a great cry. It's this picture of, of wailing in suffering and sorrow and emptiness. This picture in Egypt is just a little, tiny, teeny-weeny picture of the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Teeth that awaits those who do not have the blood of Christ covering their lives. Now, Pharaoh, who has also lost his firstborn son, is ready. Now, at this point, Pharaoh is finally ready to drive the people out of Egypt. So he sends a message to Moses and Aaron by night. And did he summon Moses and Aaron and they appear before him? Or did he send a message to Moses and Aaron? I, I tend to think he sent a message because Moses said to Pharaoh, I will not see your face again. And so depending on how you take that, I, I, I would take that to be literal that Moses didn't see Pharaoh again after that. And so there's a message here that is sent to Moses and Aaron quickly. I mean, this has to happen immediately. Men on on horses, men getting to Moses and Aaron where they are as quickly as possible with Pharaoh's message. A series of commands Pharaoh gives, followed by a plea. Up, go. Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. Pharaoh does not want them to leave without giving him a little blessing, a big blessing. What's interesting here is you hear nothing from Moses. There is no blessing to give. There is no blessing to give. Pharaoh has been defeated. God has exalted himself over Pharaoh excuse me, over Pharaoh and over all the gods of Egypt. Yahweh has declared that he alone is God and there is no other. Has God declared that to your ears, to your heart? Are you hearing that message, what the Israelites heard and what they felt and what they knew and what they believed? Is that what we are receiving here today? Or is this just another time at church just another Sunday, just another day of life. Soon, all of our lives will be over. And all these moments, under God's word, we will have to give an account for. If we spurn the Lord, if we reject what he does in our hearts, hear the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've been gracious to us this morning in bringing us here to worship you through song and the Lord's Supper and being able to hear your word read, preached, sung, demonstrated. Lord, you're, you're so good to us and kind to us. 
Father, would we be like the Israelites were on that day when you graced them, Lord, with one mind and one heart and they bowed and worshiped and they obeyed you. Lord, would we not see a Christian life in our minds that does not involve obedience to our king? Would we not buy the foolish lie of the devil that we can just kind of straddle the fence and it's going to be okay in the end? Father, help us hear all the warnings of your word. Help us hear Jesus' words that many will say to me in that day, I I did all these things in your name and, and Christ will say, depart from me. You worker of lawlessness, for I never knew you. Will we not hear the words of Jesus when he said that a tree, a tree, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit? Good tree does not bring forth bad fruit. Lord, will we listen to your son as he says to us that a man who hears his words and does not do them, does not do them, will be like a man who built his house on sinking sand. When the winds came and the floodwaters came, that house fell and great was its fall. No, Lord, would we be like those who hear your word and do it because we believe that you alone are God and there is no other. Would you be with us now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper and remember the true Passover lamb, who died for us, who lives in us, and who will come again to take us home. In his name we pray, amen. If you'll be serving the Lord's Supper this morning, let me ask you to go ahead and come forward when...